Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. We are coming to the end of the autobiography of an idea, but this chapter face to face is the culmination of this book because it is summation of Louis Sullivan's philosophy. And we're going to, let's see, let's see what we can do with it. Uh, we're going to start with Sherry, Rob, Marisa, Joya, and Bali. Sherry, take it away. Okay. So everyone, I'm really excited about this one. Um, I have tried for many, many years to get Rob to read this book <laughs> and I've finally succeeded. Um, but what's happened because of that is I had read this chapter um, fairly recently, underlined all sorts of things I wanted to talk about and then made sure that Rob had the book early enough to read through it. Um, and then he said, there are no bridges and no buildings. So he gave me this card to read, which says, Mr. Chairman, I cede the balance of my time. <laughs> and now I'm supposed to hand it to Rob. This is, this is what happens when you're married to someone who watches too much C-SPAN. Too much C-SPAN. So um, <laughs> I am giving my time to Rob to talk philosophy and Louis Sullivan. <laughs> you can have your card back. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, Rob. Go ahead. All right. So yeah, Sherry's off the hook this week. This is all. This is all non-visual stuff. This is all ideas. But I prepped. Well, no, you, you, your underlining was invaluable. To me. Oh, it was good, great. Good. Well, I thought we, we just said, you know, we'd be going over so much of the same uh, uh, territory. Uh, all right. So I'm going to talk about this. This is when he finally gets down to okay. I'm getting down to the whole philosophy at the root of this. Um, and uh, my general impression is I really like the first half. And then the second half, things sort of wander around a bit and it gets a little lost. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, the first half, he has a very intriguing formulation where he talks about how uh, the, the intellectuals have failed to see man, that they've seen this, this false, this fantasy thing in, in place of what man really is. And specifically, what he says is that uh, uh, there, their insistent view of man, a further product of their fantasy, lay in the dogma, protein and form, that man is creature. So the idea that man is depraved and that he is a creature is their error, and they have not seen man as he really is. So that leads him to say, well, what is, if we see man as he really is, what do we see? So here's the my version starting on page 264. I'm going to read about a page of material here, which I think is the center of the whole thing. To begin, man is a worker and a wanderer in, very, in varied ways. With his bodily powers, he may go here and there. He may move objects about. He may change the order of things. Here at the onset, we find a portentous power, the power to change situations. He can make new situations. With his 10 fingers, he can do wonderful things, make things he needs, make accessory things to extend his muscular powers. Thus, he manipulates. He further changes situations. He changes his situations. He creates an environment of his own. One sees here the adventurer, the craftsman, the doer, ever growing in power. Thus, man's first collective power within himself is the power to aspire, to work, to wonder to go from place to place, near and far, to return to his home. Now comes into view what that power we call curiosity, and coupled with it, the power to inquire. Man's power to inquire we call a mental power to distinguish it from his somatic power. Somatic basically means referring to the body, so the power of his body. It may have had a beginning. It can have no end. The results of inquiry we call knowledge. Its high objective we call science. The, ob the objective of science is more knowledge, more power, more inquiry, more power. Now, if to, the power, if to the power to do, we add the power to inquire, man, the worker, grows visibly more compact in power, more potent to change situations and to make new situations for himself. The situation may be a deep gorge in the wilderness. The new situation shows a bridge spanning the chasm in one great leap. See, there are bridges. There She's saying, see, there are bridges. Well, this is the same bridge we talked about last week. <laughs> so we all have the image in our mind of the, the high bridge, you know, the, the going, make, crossing the chasm in one leap. Uh, 
well, let's see. That thus it is that man himself, as it were, leaps the chasm through the adventurous coordination of his power to inquire and his power to do. And thus the natural man ever enlarges the, his range of beneficence. His life experiences are, reveal, are real. He reverses the dictum, I think, therefore I am. It becomes to him, I am, therefore I inquire and do. It is this affirmative I am that is man's reality. Wherefore, warrior, philosopher, and priest turned their backs. This I am they could not see, could not suspect, even as it stood at their elbow regarding them with ordinary human eyes. For it had been settled long ago on abundant evidence that man is creature and depraved. So there he is returning to that theory about how the, the, uh, was it, uh, the warrior, philosopher, and priest had turned their backs on man and seen him uh, and created a false version of him. Now, for those, you know, because we came into this partly out of coming out of the fountainhead and we're going back to the fountainhead. So I found it interesting this formulation where he takes Descartes, I think, therefore I am, and he reverses it. That's something that Ayn Rand borrowed and made it a little more pithy, where she says uh, in Atlas Shrugged, she says, you know, reversing a uh, famous error, we have to, instead of saying, I think, therefore I am, we have to say, I am, therefore I'll think. And that's essentially, you know, she's simplifying this idea that she took from, from Sullivan. Um, now, the idea of man's power to think and power to do being related, I think comes in from this whole idea of the power to change situations and to make new situations. That is the power to inquire and the power to do from the very beginning. Because you know, the reason why animals can't create new situations, the reason why they adapt to their environment instead of adapting their environment to themselves is because they don't have the ability to break down uh, and analyze and break down the nature of their situation and uh, understand the principles behind it and to imagine cre the creation of a new situation. You know, it's not just the 10 fingers, it's the brain that allows us to imagine and to, to rearrange the environment we see it, to rearrange it mentally in our mind and therefore realize that we could rearrange it uh, uh, physically through our action. And actually this whole thing about making new situations and it reminded the thing that came to my mind of this was his story of him as a, as, as a kid out in the woods, creating the stones and making the dam, mm -hmm. right? This is his primitive version of that. And this being the primitive power of man from, from the very beginning, that you can walk, in, you can walk into a, a, the woods and you see a stream and you can move rocks and you can dam the stream and you can make a new situation that would suit your purposes. Or in, in his case, it was to amuse himself, but to suit, you know, ultimately to suit your purposes. Now, he, after that section I just read, he goes on to talking about um, uh, the, uh, he has a sort of analogy of a series of inversions, like uh, the idea like the, the sun being at the center of the, of the solar system rather than the earth at the center was one of these inversions. And so we talk, that's his way of leading up to talking about a, the need for a third inversion In reactive consequence of age-long self-repression and self-beguilement, the world of mankind is now preparing its way for a third inversion. The world of heart and head is becoming dimly sentient that man in his power is free spirit, creator. Um, emerging from the heritage of mystical unconsciousness and fantasy, the world of mankind is stirring. Man's deeds are about to become conscious deeds in the open. All right, so this idea of man as free spirit. Now, that's an interesting formulation because the uh, philosophically that he identifies, he says the free spirit and he immediately says creator. And that's what he means by, the, by man as a free spirit, as a creator is, uh, and in fact, uh, he sort of explains it just a little bit right afterwards, the next little section marked off by the little asterisks. Um, Never in man's time has there been such sound warrant for an attitude of optimism as in our own. Yet to him who, who in myopic fear looks but at the troubled surface, there appears equal warrant in the fantasy of pessimism. What a price man shall have paid for freedom, for freedom from the thrall of his powerless imagination, for freedom from the stranglehold of his own phantasmal self. So that's, I think, what he means by free spirit is, is he, and I'll I have a couple sections I'll point to later, where he basically means freedom from the uh, unthinking, 
uh, uh, prohibitions and uh, we call it later consecrated wisdom of the past. So the idea is that there have been certain ideas and certain ways of doing things that have been frozen in amber and set down as rules that stop you from thinking and creating. And so man as free spirit means we're going to break out from all those rules and we're going to create new things without those without artificial restrictions. Um, now, this idea of the free spirit, I said, I mentioned, because it was an idea that was floating around in the culture at the time. So this was written, what, 1920-ish? 1924, I think. I can't remember the exact date. But um, a little before this, probably 20, 30 years before this, That's the true. word free spirit had been used a lot by Nietzsche. And I think it was like an idea going through the culture at the time. This is the late 19th and early 20th century, the, the, the formative years of Louis Sullivan this idea of the free spirit. Now, Nietzsche had a totally different meaning for it, or a significantly different meaning, because he had more of a, um, more of a subjectivist meaning to it. So this idea was that nothing really exists in reality. All what really exists is our drives and our urges. And the free spirit is the person who builds up theories without really believing in anything. And it's sort of like a person spinning subjectivist ideas. And that seems to be the opposite implicitly of what Sullivan is talking about, that he's not talking about, you know, you're, you're spinning your own subjective theories. So Nietzsche had this idea of, you know, you have, he called it a skepticism that undermines yet nevertheless takes over, was a phrase that stuck in my mind from, from one of his works where he says, basically, you're gonna develop all these new theories and new ideas all based on the idea that it's all subjective. So you're going to fanatically believe in it and promote it and, and, and inhabit this world while also recognizing that it's false or that it's, that it's all subjective in some way. Uh, and that's his idea of what it means to be a free spirit, Nietzsche's. Uh, whereas he's coming up with a different version, which is Sullivan. we're gonna, Sullivan's coming up with a different version, which is we're going to break out from the uh, conventional wisdom and the uh, sort of, uh, the, 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 the arbitrary rules set down by the past, and we're going to be able to create new things. Now, um, what I find though is like right after the page after this, we get to, oh, we have another power, the power of choice, and that leads us to morality. And that's where I found that things after that sort of get much more vague and poetic. So when you talk about, well, what do you mean by morality? What do you mean about this new system of society that we're going to create? And there's lots of talks about kindness and beneficence and imagination, and it's all kind of poetic and vague. And he never, there's, that's where I get unsatisfied. And I'm like, okay, let's nail this down specifically to what you're saying. And there is no specific. There's just, there's a lot of great words and nice poetry, but he doesn't really get specific and clear about what he's, what he's actually talking about, what this world is going to be like and, and what choices we're going to make. Um, that's actually what I think is a, uh, a, uh, a point of agreement with Nietzsche, but I think for different reasons, because Nietzsche also has this character of everything being very vague, if anybody's read him, everything being very vague and poetic. And uh, in his case, I think it's because having said everything's subjective, uh, and we're going to create all these new things, but it's all going to be totally subjective. He didn't, he really, there is nowhere to go from there. Right? He didn't have any basis for going from there. So all he could do was sort of emote about how great all this, this new world is going to be that we're creating. But I don't really know what it is going to be and what it specifically is going to consist of because it's all subjective. How could you have anything, you know, how could you then predict or, or indicate um, uh, uh, what, what specifically it's going to be if it's all just spun out of people's subjective urges? In the case of Sullivan, I think it's more that you know he has he's able to project some ideas about what this new future is going to look like in his own field in architecture, but more broadly than that, in the arm of you know morality and a social organization in terms of a democratic system, he's not he as I say it's it's he doesn't know where to go from here. But it's more like it's just he reaches the limits of his specific knowledge, so he's able to you know what he reminds me more of in this context is Victor Hugo. Uh, because Victor Hugo always had this effusive poetic belief in the future and how great the future was going to be. But, you know, what this future society was that we were heading towards that was going to be so much better than the past 
what it actually was, he couldn't really tell you. But he had all this effusive, wonderful poetry about what about how the future was going to be great and the ideal, we're going to reach the ideal, whatever that is, but he didn't really know what it was. So it was this sort of thing where he, he sort of sees these outlines of, we're going to be able to do something amazing in the, in the future, but he reaches the limits of his ability to project what that actually is outside of his own field, in Sullivan's case. Um, there are a couple other ideas in here though that I wanted to draw out, which I thought were particularly interesting. Um, and one of them was, uh, actually, I, I didn't know if I made a note here of the section where he talks about feudalism. Oh. Okay, I don't have the paragraph marked, but he talks about the idea of uh, feudalism as being the idea that we traded off uh, basically we traded safety and a secure society for uh, a relationship of masters and servants. And you know, that we basically sold ourselves short by, by accepting the, the character of being, oh, here we go, the feudal concept of self-preservation. So 271 on mine. The feudal concept of self-preservation is poisoned at the core by the virulent assumption of master and man, of potentate and slave, of external and internal suppression of the life urge of the only one, of its faith in human sacrifice as a means of salvation. Uh, so he's, he has an interesting analysis of what uh, feudalism is, that, is psycho, that feudalism is ultimately not a political system, but a psychological system. It's a fear of the freedom to use man's powers. And so in the fear of your freedom to use man's powers, you accept uh, leaders who will use, I, I, there's another section, and I can't remember exactly where it is. He said, you'll accept leaders who will you be able to use those powers and who use them on behalf of everybody else and everybody is the servant of those leaders. Then he says, but then the leaders become corrupt, uh, almost immediately become corrupt and stagnant and uh, use their powers only to, uh, uh, to, to, for, to, to, for the quest of power over others and not to create something new. Uh, so it's this idea of you have to accept the power of the individual to create something rather than uh, the individual having to seek safety in uh, being under a leader or a feudal, uh, some sort of feudal power. But the most interesting part here is um, where he talks about the paradox here of uniqueness. Here we go. While, while it is plain when all wrappings are removed, we shall find all men to be alike in native possession of essential powers. We are at once confronted by this paradox that all men obviously are different, that no two are alike. In plain words, we find each human being unique. When we say unique, we mean the only one, that each one is the only one. If we have used long upon the immense fecundity and, indus and industry of life, the paradox vanishes the only one and the all coalesce. The individual and mass become one in a new phase of power whose stupendous potency of creative art and civilization stuns the sense of possibility. Now opens to our view the democratic vista. Now see unfold the power of the only one in multiple and the one becomes a vast complex of unique powers inspired by its, of its free spirit and its power of beneficence. Now, I think what he's getting at here, this is, he's getting more poetic here, but I think what he's getting at is this idea of the only one in multiple and the one become a vast complex of unique powers. So the idea is that on the one hand, all men are alike, on the other hand, they're all different. And the solution to the paradox is that all men have powers, they all have, every person's individual powers are unique and the power of man as a whole is the sum of all of these unique and very different individual powers pursued individually by different people. So it's the idea that it's the, uh, the why are you changing my page? Sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna lose my spot when she's doing this. It's the idea that uh, the power of the whole comes from the very uniqueness and diversity of the powers of all the individual members. Uh, that we all have the same faculties, but used in different ways and with different characteristics. 
And that creates that out of that variety and diversity comes even more power because you have a multiple, a vast complex of unique powers. So not just everybody doing the same thing, but a vast complex of unique powers. Um, and that's where he gets down to the only one is ego, the I am, the unique, the most precious of man's powers, their source and summation in diversity. Without ego, which is life, man vanishes. Ego signifies identity. It is the free spirit. Um, he says it is the, oh, and he has a nice biblical analog, reference here. It is the sign and symbol of man's immense integrity. The I am that I am. Isn't that Popeye? Yeah, she says, isn't that Popeye? Uh, I am that I am is from the King James Version of the Bible. Yeah, God, God has asked what he is. And he says, I am that I am. Which it's I have, who, who knows what that means in the Bible, but yeah, it also sounds like Popeye. Can you do Popeye? No, uh, maybe later. <laughs> uh, it says, uh, and he comes to the world of humanity, the multitudes, the universe becomes an ego cosm. And I think that's where he's going with this idea of, you know, the, um, the, the only one and multiple, the one become a vast complex of unique powers. So this vast complex of unique powers of, individual egos, each with its own uniqueness and its own characteristics, pursuing its own goals. That is what he means by the ego cosm. This, I think, is very interesting because it, it ties into also something that was going on a lot in the 19th century. So one of my favorite stories uh, that I'm, I'm going to be pursuing more details about in the future is uh, the history of something called New Harmony. Now, New Harmony, Indiana, is this it's a town in Indiana, still exists to this day. And it was a, uh, a place where a group of people called the Owenites, this is a, they were sponsored by this a wealthy industrialist who had sort of socialist ideals. And so they created this socialist colony, this socialist model community in Indiana, financed by this guy's money from the Industrial Revolution, right? So they use capitalist money, but they said, no, we're going to create a new kind of society. And it's going to be a society in which we're going to get rid of ego, rid of the ego. We're going to get rid of the of individualism. And I, I first came across this because I was trying to track down the, the root of the word individualism. When, when did this come into, into use? When did it start being adopted as a, as a word? The, the word didn't really exist in the 18th century. And it, it, one of the earliest uses is from the Owenites at New Harmony, who used it as a pejorative. You know, individualism is the problem we have right now. Too much emphasis in the, in the individual. We need to have socialism, socialism. You know, the society needs to be the focus. And this uh, idealistic community, this sort of socialist community went through the natural life cycle that a lot of the, uh, the a bunch of these were formed all over the place at the time in the early 19th century. Mm -hmm. And it went through the natural life cycle where it basically lasts for three years, then it collapses among bitterness and recrimination among the various members. And most of the people then after it collapses, they go off, they go back to New York, they go wherever. And they continue though to, to believe in the ideal of socialism. And you know, we just didn't, it didn't, we didn't do it right this time. We need to try it again. We need to make it bigger. We need to make, you know, we need to do something different. We need to try harder next time. But there's one guy, and I can never, I can't remember the guy's name. It, it, he's not known today, but there's one guy who came out of that who played a role in popularizing individualism as a positive rather than negative term. And he, he, the lesson he took from New Harmony, now he had some weird ideas in economics. That's one of the reasons why he's not um, that well known. But the big lesson he took from it is, no, the individual is what we need. It's individual creativity and innovation. That's what makes things work. And the reason we failed is we tried to clamp down on that instead of letting it instead of letting individualism uh, go free and, and and letting people be individuals and pursue their individual goals and allow them to and and uh, uh encourage and allow them to create so he would he took from that lesson of that they tried to stamp out individualism and the society failed and the lesson he took is no you don't have to stamp out individualism you want to encourage individualism that the individual flourishing and thinking and creating and innovating and doing that's the source of all the energy that helps create things and helps make a society work. And you can see, so that this is one of the other ideas sort of floating around in the culture. The Owenites and, and New Harmony was like in the 1820s. So it would have been sort of before all this begins. But these people coming out of there and making these arguments and having these discussions 
that would have been absolutely going on in during Sullivan's youth. So you can see how that's also part of the social context here that this idea of the ego cosm of the unique individuals who make up a whole that is much more powerful because of the uniqueness of the individuals, that that is an idea that would have been, uh, he would have been, that's, that's a, a debate and discussion people would have been having that he was drawing from and coming up with this, with this idea. Now, one last thing I want to look at, if I, oh, here, here you're on the right page too, uh, is this idea of, uh, let's see. Yes, here we go. This idea of consecrated wisdom. Uh, here we go. Plainly, the outworking of so sublime a conception as that of rearing the fabric of a worthwhile civilization upon the basic truth of man's reality as a sure foundation implies the inversion of a host of fixed ideas, quote, consecrated by the wisdom of the ages, unquote. The time has come to place the wisdom of the ages in the balance of inquiry to ascertain when weighed, wherein it may be found to be wanting in the human sense. It is also time to test out the folly of the ages, the multifarious corruption involved in abstract and concrete irresponsibility, the abuse of power. Um, so test, I'm, I'm skipping a few things so we can still a little more pithy. So testing, we shall find that alike the wisdom and folly of the ages rests in utter insecurity upon a false concept of the nature of man. Uh, and then saying that uh, uh, life urging up us upward to open the free spirit of man so long suppressed under the dead weight of the consecrated wisdom of the ages and its follies. So that's returning to what he means by this idea of the free spirit, that you were going to, the dead weight of the consecrated wisdom of the ages is sort of there as this artificial barrier to your to creativity, and we're going to break through that and come up with new ideas, as he had done in architecture. Um, but everything, I think that's, I think it's interesting that the things that I find most specific and most interesting in this are the things that are closest to what the work he was doing, mm -hmm. right? So this idea of let's let's subject the consecrated wisdom of the ages to uh, to scrutiny is basically him saying let's take this all this stuff about the five orders and this chart we have of measurements that you're supposed to go from about how to, how wide the columns are and how tall the columns are and what kind of capital you have let's take all that and re and question all that and and go out and be free to go out in new directions architecturally so the closer he is to that field where he is dealing with this concretely in his own work the more concrete he is in his ideas about this i'm gonna take over if oh. you're done Okay, Are you, you want to reclaim the balance yeah, of your time? To, <laughs> I'm reclaiming the balance of my time. Um, because what Rob's talking about here, about um, the philosophical underpinnings of what Sullivan's talking about, um, like Rob said, when it gets to architecture is where it's really got some foothold he really is making. And I think it's because in that in that aspect, he's got enough broad knowledge that he can bring it down to the specifics. Um, some of the other philosophical things he's talking about, democracy and, and his view of man, um, Rob finds it still too floating. But um, when he's getting to building in the built environment is when we really start seeing um, something happen with these ideas. And he writes, this is page 273, um, a civilization that shall reflect man. Remember everything we've been talking about from Sullivan, from kindergarten chats, all of these buildings, all of these constructions, they're reflecting who that person is. So a civilization shall reflect man sound to the core and kindly in the exercise of his will to choose a right a civilization that shall be a living voice, the spring song, the saga of the power of his ego to banish fear and fate, and in the courage of adventure and of mastery, mastership to shape his destiny. And then there's this line here that I just love. Such dream is a vigorous daylight dream of a man's abounding power 
that he may establish in beauty and in joy on the earth a dwelling place devoid of fear. And I think that's um, a particularly interesting part. He's, he's, and he's referring here to fear as in fear is that underpinning of that feudalist structure. It's not that, you know, you're developing um, a, a dwelling place where there's not any bogeyman. Uh, <laughs> no, this is, this is, he's making reference in fear here to that feudalist structure of following what's been done before blindly. Um, and that's where that line of fear is coming from. But also notice that he has this, this very inspiring stuff about spring songs and sagas and all that, which is very Sullivan-esque. But he also says, and I'm not sure if I can find it immediately here. He also says something about how, oh yeah, here we go. Nor can, uh, a lot of people understood that such creative energy cannot arise from a welter of pallid abstractions as a soil, nor can it thrive within the tyranny of any cut and dried system of economics or politics. So this is him basically saying, if you want, if you want an economic or political theory from me, you're going, we're looking in the wrong place, but he's not going to, so that's part of my thing. Like, well, I want to know the specifics of what is this society going to look like that you're talking about. And in a way he's basically punting on that and saying, look, I'm not, I'm not getting down into these uh, petty details of, of politics and economics. So to some extent, he's basically stiff arming me on that. And that's why, that's why, I, that's why I get grumpy about this. because I want to know the politics and the economics. <laughs> but you know if, if you look at this as okay this is louis Sullivan, he's an architect what is he have, you know if you're looking at it as what you like i said the, the closest he gets to his own field where he's making the contribution that based on the concretes of, of his career and his and the decades of thinking that's where it gets more satisfying so i'm, I'm not gonna i'm gonna stop complaining about it now <laughs> all right uh let me do one thing uh, uh sherry if i may and uh, maritza if i may i'm, I'm going to uh, comment a little bit because I want to put this into perspective. Um, uh, Rob, fantastic comments. Okay. This, I agree with almost everything that you've said, but I've read Sullivan a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, so I will give you my take on this. So he starts by saying that man is a worker. That's basically saying, you know, the term that I'm using now is, you know, man is a designing animal. You know, we live by transforming our surroundings. That's our nature. Okay, so that's the core thing. And when it comes to architecture of how do you actually do this, he does a spectacular job mm -hmm. of, of describing that. Okay. And where is it that he becomes metaphorical? More He's metaphorical here too. He's metaphorical first, but then he has explicit ideas where you can actually, he actually shows and he actually designs stuff and shows you, this is what I mean. So he has a full cycle complete on the idea of man as a designer when it applies to architecture. He, from there, he's saying, I can, this vision needs to be carried into the realm of politics. It needs to work out the relationship, proper relationship between individual and community, individual and others. And he, there he is very metaphorical, he's very approximate, absolutely, okay? But the key to seeing the direction in which he's going is to look back at his core idea. That is form follows function. What he's doing, what he's saying, when he says that man is a designing animal, or he's saying man is a worker, fundamentally, that is first is that what he's saying is that man has functions, man has these powers that enables him to create forms, to transform his surroundings. So man has functions that leads to creation of forms. So functions and then forms. And that's what he's calling the free spirit. That's what he's calling his, all the grandeur that he's talking about is that the function of man creates great forms, is capable of creating great forms. Then he has an idea of inverted self. Just apply his core idea. Inverted self means form, form comes first. 
okay? All his criticism, whether he talks about the dead weight of society, wrong forms, in every way, it's everybody who is starting with forms first and how that kills function, how that kills the individual. Well, so that I, is, the, go ahead. The, the, the in, just struck me, the inversion of form follows function is yes. form suppresses function. Exactly, so it's, it's, exactly. It's wrong when you reverse it, Exactly. Suppress suppressed functions. So right. form suppresses function. So, so the classic example of that would be Marx, who says goods are here. Goods mm -hmm. are forms that have been produced by certain functions. Goods are here. Now the functions can be gotten away with and the goods will be there. That's, that's the theory. Similarly, all the monarchies of the past, actual work is being done by people. There are these structures. Structures are here. Let's preserve the structures to the hell with the people. So it is that that he's talking about, full scale in politics. Now, our ability to talk about politics is much greater, but if you just take that principle, function is primary, the individual is primary, um, and that, that reversal. Now, one sad thing is that before his time, actually the solution to this problem was already there. Because if you look at the question of individual, so the basic, what is the basic idea he's saying? Individual is sovereign and all the forms have to serve the individual. That's what declaration of independence is about. Mm. Okay, that is the declaration of independence. And it is a profound reversal of the entire tradition of the Western thought on politics, where it always holds society is, is primary and society is basically sum total of all the forms that have been created. That is primary, that's the dead weight. So the solution that he's actually hoping for is already was already there at his time. He just did not see that, okay? That it was essentially, the, it, it was the essential solution. The problem that he's working on, e plur, pluribus unum, that's the problem he's working on. That's the problem the founding fathers are trying, you know, pr not trying to solve, but solved. And that made possible everything else, including this 19th century that he's seen. So you can just take that idea, form follows function, and just run it across, apply it to founding fathers, and you get basically what he is trying to aim at. He goes further than that. He's, the, his greatness is that he sees kind of the psychology behind these things. So he's saying, why is it that these people have this inverted self? He, and he identifies fear. So it's love versus fear. So the people, the, you know, a proper human being loves themselves, others, and everything that they can create and do with the world. The inverted self fears, is full of fear about their own functions, full of fear about functions of other people. So is holding on to the forms that are already there and trying to enslave others and themselves or put themselves into servitude because they regard, because they are inverted. So think of it, it's like a proper man is standing upright. These people are standing, facing exactly opposite, upside down. And that's what most of the society has been, most of the institution. If you look at even companies are like that. Sometimes in the, in the growing stage of the companies, it is, you know, function, form is following function. And then they think that, okay, now they have made it. Now they're trying to holding out to the forms and then they start dying. So it's the, it's a very simple principle that runs through politics beautifully, except that he has not thought in detail about right. politics, but the, the, the principle is the same. It's the principle behind, behind the declaration of independence. Uh, that's, that's, that's what it would look like. So that's why, that's my take on what it would look like. I don't know. Um, go, go ahead, uh, Sherry. Oh, uh, go, well, no, go ahead and finish. I was just going to say that that's why I'm going to stop complaining about Sullivan because I realized after reading this that yeah. complaining about that he didn't do that part about it is that's really that's not mean. what I should be expecting from him. Yeah. Right. You know, because what he did was that, uh, see, again, I, I'm, I'm very cognizant of the times of the people and yeah. where they worked, how they worked. Now, what he did was that he completely revolutionized how to think about architecture. And more, he gave you the principle, the key, 
which can solve all these problems. Yeah. You know, just form follows function. That's it. And you just go across any problem and you can, you can, it will completely transform the way you look at it. Um, and he did not. I mean, the thing is that it is a very hard problem, the individual and society. And I do not think, you know, I mean, it is true. Every, every thinker is like that. You know, you can always say, okay, this person did great things, but he did not solve that problem. <laughs> you know, the, you know, people do what they can. <laughs> uh, yeah. well, I love those ideas. I think that's a good solution to it. But yes, <laughs> it's in terms of the details. So my only complaint is, oh, we didn't do the specifics over here. And I'm, like I said, I'm yeah. dropping that complaint. Yeah. Right. He no, also he, hasn't read the next chapter. No, where... no, he never gets there. I mean, I've read the, you know, you have to read. The, there is a full explication of this in Democracy, A Man's Search. It's a whole book. I wouldn't recommend it to you, Rob, because the problem still remains. Because yeah. you have to look at, again, his life. What he's doing is that most of his life, he did not write much. He didn't write at all. He was building. That's what, you know, he, he figured things out and he was busy building. Towards the end of his life, he said, okay, I don't want to lose, you know, I don't want to, I want to transmit it to other people. So in a hurry, he wrote all these books, Kindergarten Chats, Autobiography of an Idea, uh, Democracy, A Man's Search, A System of Architectural Ornaments, at the end of his life. So, you know, he's just giving you uh, the core idea that he has and how he, exp how he, successfully applied it to architecture throughout his life and how it may possibly be applied if you have the ability to work it out to other things. That's what that's that's how I see evaluate his work. So the one thing um, for those that are feeling like this is still too up in philosophy land um, in the very next chapter is when he's starting to really put it down in specific words of how he came up with these ideas in architecture. And I'll just jump ahead to read this one line. He writes on page 290, the dis he discovered that, and he's referring to himself in the third person there, he discovered that in truth, it was not simply a matter of form expressing function, but the vital idea was this, that the function created or organized its form. So that's our teaser to next week when I'll take Rob's card and, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll take his time. <laughs> you know, I was I was in Philadelphia and function organizing its own forms. This is that is exactly what those folks were doing in the independence hall. Mm -hmm. they, they were the functions and they were saying, okay, what form do we need, do human beings need in order to function? Um, wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rob. Rob, that was brilliant. Thanks. Uh, next up is Maritza. Man, well, I don't know. I feel like I should just talk about trees. Everything else has been said. No. Um, so most of you by now have been, you guys have heard me say before often, and I started out saying it very hesitantly, my idea that I felt that, um, the individual should be held as fiercely as the community because it was only through doing both that we could somehow forge a path towards the improvement of our societies and our communities. Um, I started kind of almost saying that apologetically. And as we've um, walked together with Louis Sullivan and a few others, I've kind of felt more emboldening and um, more convinced that, that that's okay, this is what I'm saying and I'm not the only one saying it. So I'm almost giddy reading this um, a chapter here because that's exactly what I hear. There's a lot, there's so much more, but I'm gonna focus a little bit more on this idea of, um, and I love the word that she can't just use sovereign. The idea that the individual is sovereign, but so is community. And for community to be sovereign, the individual must also be sovereign. So let's talk about a forest for a moment, right? So, so the thing about trees in a forest is that they're actually an interconnected web. Um, they share carbon, water, nutrients, um, chemical alarm si signals. All of these things go from tree to tree, even across species. But here's the thing, each tree 
on its own has to strive for sunlight. One thing that other, one thing that this network of forest trees cannot help the individual tree with is reaching for the sun. Each tree has to do that on their own. So if we look at that as kind of the model for how a healthy society should be, it seems very, very simple and clear, right? Sure, you, you should rely on your society to bring you vital nutrients, chemical alarm signals. But if you're waiting for them to bring you the sun, you're gonna die. The, the idea here is that don't give up the eye. And again, you guys have heard me say it before. My absolute favorite quote is Ayn Rand's. Um, it's from Ayn Rand's um, essay on um, selfishness. And she talks about, in order to say, I love you first, one must acknowledge the I. And that, I, I'm looking at this, I actually wrote in the sidelines here, this is straight up Rand for some of what I was reading here. And it's, it's, so it's, it's amazing that I was not aware of Louis Sullivan works when I was younger, I got introduced to Ayn Rand. So some of the concepts and the philosophical ideas that I have walked through for most of my life, they actually come from Louis Sullivan. And that's just mind blowing to realize. I've been kind of seeing that as we've walked through with kindergarten chats and the rest of the autobiography of an idea, but this chapter just puts that loud and clear for me um, the, you know, the, there are so many things. I mean, I'm going to repeat something that Rob already read to you guys, because I really do find that it's just, you can hear it a million times and still be the richer for it. When Sullivan is telling us about the, you know, he even says paradox. He says, he speaks about how we in our day to day, we view the individual versus um, society or our community or even our culture, we view a paradox between the two as though there's, they, they, they cannot live in harmony. And he states it's because we have this idea that unique is an either or situation. But he's emphasizing here, he, say, he tells us, in plain words, we find each human being unique. When we say unique, we mean the only one. Thus, each one is the only one. If we have mused long upon the immense fecundity and industry of life, the paradox vanishes. Remember, we're talking about the paradox between the individual and society. And he says it, it vanishes. What does he mean? He tells us the only one and the all coalesce. The individual and the mass become one. In a new phase of power, whose stupendous potency of creative art in civilization stuns the sense of possibility. Now see unfold the power of the only one in multiple and the one become a vast complex of unique powers inspired of its free spirit and its power of beneficence. The and I'm gonna read something from, I'm gonna fast forward another page because what he's ultimately telling us is that when we, well, what he's saying is he stands, he's of the mind, the belief that going through for ages past, we have been denigrating the individual. So because we've been denigrating the individual, we're saying um, many of our views of individuality are invalid. And he's saying, no, no. In order to find this oneness, we have to validate the view of the individual of the self as valid and important. And he, he does say, you know, when he talks about the choice. So I wrote down a bunch of stuff here, these powers that Sullivan tells us, the power of imagination, the power of curiosity, power to inquire, the power of choice, the power to receive, the power of emotions. And then said slightly differently, so she kind of talked about man as worker. Well, Sullivan also tells us to think of man as imagination, man as will, man as creator. 
So the, these would be considered a container of self powers, right? But they all can be applied to our culture, to the betterment of ourselves and everything around us. And I just, it's so almost satisfying to read this because it's so profound a statement and there's not enough people saying it. The, um, you know, I'm gonna read one little piece and then I'm gonna shut up. <laughs> I'm gonna leave you with questions because there's a section here where it's all questions and they're all things that you can take each question and talk about for hours. And for those of you who hadn't had the time yet to read this chapter, I wanna put this as an earworm for you. Thus in portrayal stands man the reality, container of self powers, a moving center of radiant energy, awaiting his time to create anew in his proper image. Are then the multitudes infertile? Is genius rare? Has our traditional education and culture left us wholly blind? Have we forgotten the children, eagles at our elbow? The springtide of genius there, shall we continue to destroy? What is our choice? How have we exercised it? How shall we exercise it? Is our moral power asleep? Are we without faith in our own? Whence then is this story of a child's dream of power? What shall our dream be? Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Maritza. Uh, I really like the point. I want to focus on two points. One is the point about imagination, role of imagination in, in man. And we're doing this book, The Design Way. And he talks about man as a designer, where you are taking in the real, the true. So metaphysics, you know, what, where are you? Epistemology of how do you figure it out? And then what for or why? What is the ideal? Using all of that, you are using your imagination to project something better than what is. And you are actually going ahead and creating that. And that's what design is all about. And imagination is the thing that is actually helping you project that. And will is at the root of that, where you are saying that I will do that because it, it is your commitment to saying that I will bring all these things together and I will project, I will imagine what can be and I will actually build it. So this structure um, is, is so powerful. And what you create, the second thing, second point I wanted to make is about this individual and community, the middle term is forms, good forms. Because if you look at the structure of the government of the US, it is all structure. So what forms should we create so that all these individuals who have life, liberty and pursuit of happiness can actually thrive? So it is all about designing. And that just doesn't apply at that level. It applies at every level of human interaction. I try to solve this problem every time during a meetup. What form is the proper form so that each individual can do the best they can and add value to each other? Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Maritza. Next up is Joya. Thank you, everybody. So because of the way Rob structured his presentation, I'm actually going to start at the end of this chapter and then go back to the beginning. So the, the chapter ends with this beautiful, inspiring line. Louis Sullivan says, thus broadens and deepens to our comprehension the power and the glory of the democratic vista. 
And when I read this, this last word was the one that really captured me and I think sums up the essence of what Louis Sullivan really has to say about democracy, that it's a democratic vista. And notice that he doesn't say a system, because system is another one of Louis Sullivan's favorite words. And with his love of engineering, we know that he creates systems. He has a system of architectural ornament, but he doesn't say that we're gonna have a democratic system because that's not something that he's done or something that he's created. But what he gives us is the democratic vista. And I even had to look up the definition of vista. What is a vista? And so I wrote it down here, that a vista is a pleasing view, especially one seen through a long, narrow opening. And to me, that really captures what I see Louis Sullivan doing here in the second part of the chapter, that there is this far away view that is pleasing, that is a goal, a potential that we can get at. But he, he, I don't think Louis Sullivan really has a lot to say about all the, the the details of what that is is that it's, it's not the system that he's worked out but where i see that louis sullivan has done a lot of great work and gives us a lot of value is with this understanding of exactly what a human being is so then this just takes us back to the beginning of the chapter and i love that the chapter is called face to face he's really asking us this question of what is man? What, what is it to be a human being? And I love even just the poetic way that he describes this, that, that what we're doing is introducing man to himself, you know, introducing a human to the human potential face to face so that we see, you know, up close and personal, you could say, what it is to be a human being, what is the potential of the human being. And that for Louis Sullivan, I see that it all comes down to this idea of powers. What are man's powers? We talked about that this is the autobiography of an idea. And in, in the last chapter, I wanted to suggest that I see that what the idea has been has been the idea of power. And in this chapter, we're going to get the 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 real description of what are man's powers. And I know Sri Khan and I, we disagree. Um, like the 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 idea, you know, you know, as four of Balos function, but I see that Louis Sullivan really has a lot to tell us about what are what are man's powers that to me that's what I see this chapter as being all about and it's been the theme that started from childhood what he's going to call here the child dream of power and we're going to see that that's what what grows and gets developed and gets worked out into a kind of system of what it is to be a human being and then I think you could say then that you know, a formulation of that of what the powers are is this idea of form follows function uh, but so I want to take us back then to the beginning of the chapter um, and just a, a line here that that I loved in the beginning when he's uh, kind of talking about where human beings in the past had gone wrong that in the past that um, you know they they saw man as creature instead of creator but he says about you know everyone that, that went wrong that you know a small feature however was overlooked by them in the neglect to observe that that their man in his depravity had created the gods and i think you know that i think is key to who louis sullivan is that we see that he sees the the potential of human beings in this ability to create what is godlike and i also even just i found this other line rather intriguing that why everyone else had gone wrong uh, but they did not see him man because he was too near too commonplace too transparent the gods were far away and could be understood so just something very interesting in that that and i think what's getting us to louis sullivan's whole approach that he's gonna get us close to face to face near to what is the human potential and then there's this I found beautiful description of what Louis Sullivan has done, where he describes what, what, what his process has been. And he says here, describing himself, one who as a pioneer worked his troubled way through the undergrowth of culture with its acceptances, its preconceptions and precious finalities. One who led on by a faith unfaltering at last arrives at the rendezvous with life, here testifies the natural man as sound to the core and kindly, yet innocent of himself, as the seat of genius, 
as container of limitless creative powers of beneficence. Solely on the strength of this faith was begun the story of a child dream of power. And that I see is the summary of what we've been reading so far, his journey, the, the story that began with a child dream of power, and that's going to lead to this culmination where he's now going to ask us, what are these powers? As he says here, what is the re reality we affirm to be man? And Rob, I thought, did a beautiful job of just starting to read through the description of all of the powers, man as the worker, as the wanderer, his power of curiosity and inquiry. The, we talked about the line of how he reverses, I think, therefore I am, to I am, therefore I inquire and do. And I love even how Louis Sullivan breaks down thinking into inquiring and doing, because it's not just this uh, like what Ayn Rand might have called a rationalistic or, you, you know, it's not just thinking in this totally abstract divorce from reality way that what thinking is, is about inquiring about reality and doing and creating and actually making things that being a worker and a wanderer is so crucial to man's powers. And then I don't, I did want to read through the other main power that he talks about, the power of choice. There's so much, I think, in, in what he says here. There lies another power in man. That power is moral. Its name is choice. Within this one word choice lies the story of man's world. It stands for the secret poise within him. It reveals as a flashlight all his imagings, his fantasies, his willful thoughts, his deeds, from the greatest to the least, even in this gliding hour we call today. This one word choice stands for the soul and single power. It is the name of the mystery that lies behind the veil of all human appearances. A word that dissolves the enigma of men's deeds. A word, a light that not only illuminates all his obvious works, all the inner springs and motives of his civilizations, but a light whose rays reach within the sanctuary of the secret thought of each and all, thus revealing the man of the past and the man of today, starkly in personal status, as a social factor of beneficence or woe. Need we know man's thoughts? View his works, his deeds. They tell his choice. And that I think is, is a, just another beautiful poetic description of something we've seen to be key to Louis Sullivan, this idea that behind the form, we see the function, that by seeing the form of the building, we see the man who is behind it. And hear that in seeing his works and his deeds, that what lies behind that is the choice. And, and I love how he identifies that aspect of it, that, that what is so crucial to man and you know, who is the man is, what his choice is. And then his connection with of of this view with the free spirit of joy. So I just wanted to read this this idea as well. The free spirit is the spirit of joy. It delights to create in beauty. It is unafraid. It knows not fear. It declares the earth to be its home, and the fragrance of earth to be its inspiration. It is strong. It is mighty in beneficence. It views its powers with emotions of adventure. Humility it knows not. It dreams a civilization like unto itself. It would create such a world for mankind. It has the strength. It sees the strength of the fertile earth, the strength of the mountains, the valleys, the far spreading plains, the vast seas, the rivers and the rivulets, the great sky is a wondrous dome, the sun in its rising, its zenith and its setting, and the night. It glories in these powers of earth and sky as in its own. It affirms itself integral with them all. It sees life at work everywhere. Life, the mysterious, the companionable, the ineffable, the immensest and gentlest of powers, clothing the earth in a pattern of radiant sublimity, of tenderness, of fairy delicacy, ceaselessly at work. 
Thus the free spirit feels itself to be likewise clothed as with a flowing shoulder garment, symbol of power akin to the fluent mystery and fecundity of life. Thus it moves in the open with vision clear. Thus is man the wonder worker, bound up in friendship with the wonder worker life. And here I think is just another poetic, beautiful description of something we know to be key to Sullivan, that what he sees as man's powers to create are grounded in the beautiful power of life. So that even if man is, you know, as he describes here, the worker, the wonder worker, that it's bound up with the wonder worker that is life. And, and Srikant had said, you know, even before about how when you know the psychology of all the people who went wrong was because they had fear of man's functions and of what man could do but this is the flip side of it this is the power and the strength and the beauty and the glory of what man can do when it is connected with and integral with all that is there in life and then we get just another i think you know, beautiful summarizing of, of what he's told us so far about man and his powers. Consider his primary powers. He, the worker, the inquirer, the chooser. Add to these the wealth of his emotions, also powers. Think how manifold they are, how colorful, how with them he may dramatize his works, his thoughts, his choosings, how he may beautify his choice. Think of his power to receive, to receive through the channels of his senses to receive through his mystic power of sympathy, which brings understanding to illumine knowledge. Think of what eyesight means as a power, the sense of touch, the power to hear, to listen, and the power of contemplation. Add these to his accumulating interblending power, that, power. Then think again of his enlarging power to act. Deep down within them lies that power we call imagination, the power instantly or slowly to picture forth, the power to act in advance of action, the power that knows no limitations, no boundaries, that renders vivid both giving and receiving, the inscrutable dynamic power that energizes all other powers. Think of man as imagination, then think of him as will. Now enrich the story of his prior mentioned powers with the flow of imagination and the steadiness of will. Think anew of his power to act, of the quantity and the quality of this power. Now think of the, the freedom such power brings. And so before we get to the freedom that such power brings, I just want to get back to that summary before. And to me, I connect this to that line that we've been repeating over and over about what breaks from within and then the breaking out from, from inside. I, I'm doing a horrible job at paraphrasing it. But someone will remind me of what that, that, that exact line has been that we've been quoting and, and re-quoting. But, but here, I think he's summarizing the fullness of that in, with, with his mature understanding of that, that it starts, as he says here, with the his emotions his of the powers to receive to take in through the power of sympathy and the power of the senses everything that nature has to offer and then once we've received and once we've taken everything then we have these mighty powers of imagination and of will the powers of as he says the flow of imagination and the steadiness of will. I love how he describes imagination as not only picturing forth and, and having no limitations, um, but that it's the inscrutable dynamic power that energizes all other powers and to act in advance of action. So we can see that in Louis Sullivan that action is so important. It's inquiring and doing, that the action is key to to what makes a human being a human being, but imagination is so important as the limitless potential that acts in advance of action, that, that allows us to have that vision of what is possible and potential, the imagination, and then couple that with the will, the commitment to actually build and create what, what we can do.
And then he's going to get forward to say, you know, now think of the freedom such power brings. And then we're, we're going to kind of get into this second section, which is kind of, you know, more about democracy and freedom, where I think he has the imagination, but not yet the full, the full system. Uh, something else that I wanted to just bring up here in this chapter as well, going a little bit forward, um, that, that I see and that I think is important here is that even though he doesn't yet have what you might call the system of democracy, he has a very clear understanding of how feudalism has gone wrong. And I think there, there's something that we can gain even from, from that, from his analysis of how feudalism has gone wrong, because in his grounding of the potential of who man is and you know, being face to face with man, we can see that feudalism is wrong. And, and I think he has some, some really interesting things here to say, even about the powers of science and how feudalism has been holding back science and how what this democratic vista is going to be has to incorporate the potential of science. So he says here, with the great inversion of the earth and the sun brought defiantly about by so small an object as a telescope, which man in his curiosity invented, created to extend his power of eyesight and the daring thought, the dream it stood for. With this shock of inversion, definitely began the greatest of man's adventures upon earth. We in present sense and in retrospect call it the modern. And he has this description of it. Yet man the worker, the inquirer, ever pushed onward in hope, came the printing press, the mariner's compass, the power of steam, railroads, great ships, the discovery and development of new vast hidden riches of earth, the harnessing of the mystical power of electricity, the land telegraph, the ocean cable, the telephone, the growth of libraries, the daily papers, the public schools, the technical schools, the automobile, vast systems of transportation of all kinds, the radio, the airplane, the mastery of the air, the mastery of the seas, the mastery of the earth, Earth, the increasing mastery of ideas, the immense growth in power of constructive imagination and of the will to do, and all to what end? What may tomorrow and tomorrow bring forth out of a blood-stained yesterday and the flowing yesterday since history's dawn? And I think Louis Sullivan here just has cataloged so beautifully the power of the industrial revolution that he has seen and witnessed. And it is one of the things that, you know, we've talked about that the founding fathers you know, had the seeds of understanding what democracy could be, but they didn't have the understanding yet of the power of the industrial revolution. And I don't think Louis Sullivan, you know, fully got it yet. He didn't fully get the system, but I think he recognized that, you know, there was something there in democracy in that seed that starts with the founding fathers. And there's something important that happens with the industrial revolution, with all of these things that have happened, you know, through science, through technology, and these have to be part of our democratic vista. And I would just encourage all of us to think about what is that vista and how can we go from the vision to perhaps creating the system. And he has much more to say here in, in what's left in the chapter about his view of education, but I know Rupali is gonna have so much to say about that. So I, I wanna leave that all for her to really tease out what Louis Sullivan has to say here. And, and I think he's right though, that there's something that's gonna start with educating people in the powers of man, in, you know, in coming face to face with man. But I would just leave it for all of you to think about, you know for yourself, what ought to be in that education? What can we take from what Sullivan has shown us coming face to face with man? And how can we envision that democratic vista and perhaps complete the work and someday turn it into a system that Rob would appreciate? <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Joya. Um, now, see, when Louis Sullivan talks about an idea, it is something very profound. So in order to figure out somebody's idea, what you have to do is you have to look at all the ideas that everybody else has come up with throughout history, what their impact has been. Then look at all the ideas of the person and try look at their entire life and then look at what idea puts everything together. Um, 
you did a fantastic job of describing man's powers. Powers are basically sub-functions of the function of man. So the core thing is to understand the function because that is what integrates all these sub-functions. These are all parts, the phases of the function of man. And the core thing that Louis Sullivan talks about and demonstrate th throughout his life is that how that function is one, you know, in that I am and what it does, that it creates forms, that that's what we are, that we are functions that create forms. And those forms that we create dramatically impacts the function. There is a virtuous loop that is going on. That is a very, you know, that's the thing that holds together everything that he has learned. It basically an idea of a person is integration of everything that he has learned about everything. And that is a central point from which everything that he did proceeds. Um, that's why form follows function is the idea of where powers as it is great. And his description of powers is just wonderful. But those are all subfunctions of man. And there are many, many people who have talked about subfunctions of man throughout history. Um, some, you know, better, some others. There are many people, but it's firstly to achieve the integration between them. That is a great thing. And secondly, is to see that man is a designer. Man is a, we live by transforming the world. That idea is relatively, it kind of comes from the, uh, it is motivated and you can see it very clearly after the industrial revolution. Um, Ayn Rand credited industrial revolution to say that, you know, that she would not have been figured out, she would not have been able to figure out that man's mind Trans, you know, the role of man's mind, she could not have been able to understand that without the industrial revolution. The same is true with Louis Sullivan. He's sitting on the top of industrial revolution to identify the, the form follows function. But then he goes beyond that of saying what happens when you regard for forms as, um, as dead, dead weight and try to hold on to it. What, how does it impact functions? It's a very profound, profound integrations. Next up is Rupali. Thank you, Shrikant. Um, so as Joya said, I am going to focus uh, on education. Uh, so the whole uh, idea that, um, you know, by knowing the nature of man, we can create a better civilization. So I, uh, let me just see. Okay, there we go. So let's begin with man, the unknown. And uh, there's a, when Maria Montessori or Louis Sullivan talk about man, they, uh, Maria Montessori talks about the child as the man, the man that's going to become. And both Louis Sullivan and Maria Montessori talk about the human potential. What is that potential? And do we even know this man um, when we are talking about human beings? And Louis Sullivan says, you know, we have, we have tried to solve the mysteries and yet he says, one will be equally amazed to note that the philosophers, theologians of all times turn their backs upon man, that from the depths of introspection, fixing their gaze in all directions, save the real one, they have uniformly for evolved a phantasm or a series of phantoms and so on and so forth. A small feature, however, was overlooked by them in neglect to observe that their man in his depravity had created their gods. Uh, and then he goes to talk about dogma and so on and so forth. And so the thing is that, all right, man is not capable of doing everything. Or man is living in fear, uh, man is, subject to everything else that's not in his control uh, is the idea. And so then how can we, with those prejudices and with those beliefs, those old habits that we have, how can then we see the powers of man that uh, are within ourselves? And we've talked about, Maritza mentioned the power of imagination and what it can do. 
But imagination we've seen throughout history can also be destructive. And Louis Sullivan talks about that in this chapter too, that yes, there is you know, a power to imagine great uh, aspiring things. And on the other hand, we've seen throughout history that um, man has used imagination to do deplorable things. And so what is it um, for the future? What does, what does the power uh, that we look for? And one is the power of choice. So throughout history, throughout civilizations, um, man has created his own environment. And uh, Shrikan talked about the individual and the multitude. So the man within, so the, the unit of civilization is the individual. And so civilization is built by multiple individuals. The imagination of many come together and Louis Sullivan talks about that. Um, again, throughout history, we've built civilizations, we've destroyed civilizations, we've inflicted harm on each other. And so the question in this chapter is, what is man? What does it mean to be a man? And what are the human potentials? Um, with that potential, if we look at the uh, powers that uh, Rob and Maritza, Joya, have all mentioned, so I'm not going to go through that again. But if we look at all of those powers, what can we really achieve? Uh, and have we achieved that? And, in this chapter, Louis Sullivan talks about the third inversion. What would that third inversion be? So um, he says uh, in this, um, you know, if, if we were to uh, look at a child, if you were to look at the human potential, we all have that, whether it is a person now or in the previous uh, eras, it doesn't matter, we all have this power, so why can't we see them? And when we come across a man, a, a human being face to face, can we recognize that person? So Maria Pontessori wrote this really small article, uh, a paper, published a paper called Reconstruction in Education. And that she, in that she says, um, you know, um, Education can help the development of the child and that we adult can give the education. The, or, that is the ordinary idea of education that you know, we as adults are responsible for ed educating the child. And both Maria uh, Montessori and Louise Sullivan say, that idea is not a right idea because it concludes that the adult can help the little child very much with his wisdom and care. The idea of education is to give to the child and to young people all the best we have. But we cannot create that person. We cannot create a man. That is the task of the child itself and is the most important side of the whole education question. What the child himself accomplishes of his own power and what not, and not what an adult man can do for him. So that, that's the distinction that both Maria Montessori and um, Louis Sullivan are making. And they say that uh, Maria Montessori goes on to say, we need to know more of the law that is behind all humanity, the source from which came all humanity, every personality, every race, every religion. That great source has a plan which is fulfilled, not through the influence of adult man on the child, but by the influence of the child on the grown up man. So it's not just you know, looking at education as what we know and what the child needs to know, but to really observe the child and say, what can we learn from this child? So man, both Maria Montessori and Louis Sullivan talk about man, the worker and the, you know, the ability to do things physically with their bodies. And um, Rob, talked, Rob read the section on, you know, using their, their 10 fingers, the, humans can manipulate things, can change and modify the environment. Man, the wanderer, seeking new places, see, and making that environment their own. Um, and, and an adventurer, you know, the child uh, is looking at everything around them and taking all of that um, experience in. And that experience is subconsciously, um, Absorbed. So what the child absorbs and creates within himself becomes so living within him that it becomes his personality. So giving these experiences 
that are all beyond the classroom walls are, is important. The other power we talked about is man the thinker. Man can create with hands. Uh, they can change situations uh, using the power of his own body and mind. And when you combine that with curiosity, so curiosity leads to inquiry. Inquiry leads to knowledge. Knowledge leads to science. Science again leads back to curiosity. And there's that whole cycle of looking at things and figuring out and making things better and better and better. And now we have the collective knowledge of all humans before us that we can, um, we can work on. So, so with that, we have the power to, uh, to create. So each of us then, both Maria Montessori and Louis Sullivan talk about the laws and powers that each of us have um, and the natural powers, the natural laws, uh, self powers that we develop amongst within ourselves and the discovery that I can do it myself. So what happens is when you're, when a child is in an environment that allows the child to uh, absorb everything around them, they can, they have the freedom to choose, the freedom to do their work, then they can take in all of the drama that's happening every day and make it their uh, own. So um, I'm just going to skip ahead to page 282 in my book and where he is talking about, you know, how, how does the child, um, how does the child work? So the child, first we have to regard its body, the child, the mind, the child heart as trust, that we believe in every child, that we know every child has the potential to do good. Then we watch for feudal, um, any feudal fear and dissolve that, uh, you know, look at things optimistically and not with pessimism. Watch uh, and teach prudence and the obvious act consequences of acts. Teach what choice means. Thus it shall teach the nature of choice at the beginning. And so by doing that, by giving children choice, and even a two-year-old can make choices. Um, we, you know, often uh, we have students who, okay, so we had a student who made a big mess on the floor during lunch and the teacher asked the student to clean up and he of course did not want to uh, clean up the, uh, the crumbs. And so there were some tears and the teacher said, okay, you have a choice to do this now or during recess. Uh, and he said, okay, I'll do it now. And very quickly, even though he was crying and was tearful, he still cleaned up the crumbs. And um, a couple of days later, I checked in with the teacher and I said, so how is your student doing? And she said, now he's giving lessons on cleaning to everybody in the classroom. <laughs> And he's only five years old, but everybody gets lesson on cleaning because he's learned it himself. So, you know, there are consequences to actions and consequences to behavior that children need to learn. The other big power that humans have uh, is the power to imagine. And, and imagination comes from reality. So both Louis Sullivan and Maria Montessori talk about being anchored in reality. So knowing what is first before saying what can be. And then as the child is gro growing within their environment, they are developing consciousness of, you know, how do I fit in? How does the society work around me? So giving them exposure and lessons in everything about history and culture and the grand stories that help them form ideas about what's right, what's wrong, you know, that, that shapes their personality too. And so here is the big part about continuous breaking in from the outside and breaking out from the inside that shapes the child's destiny. Uh, so this is Louis Sullivan's uh, quote about how experiences shape the personality from daily experiences and everyday drama. So a child, seeks um, spontaneous activity. And by being in nature, by having a balance of the scientific study uh, and also the rigor of uh, literal education by having 
the balance of being out and about uh, in nature gives the child joy. And then it is not a tiresome activity. It is something that children do very naturally in their uh, environment. So what can we do in education? And um, what, uh, how can we restructure education? What should the education look like? Um, Maria Montessori and Louis Sullivan talk about both that um, if I would be a good teacher, I, I have the need to ask the child what I can do. When I ask the child, he's so kind to answer me. Personally, please do nothing. You can do nothing directly for me. And what, you know, that, that is really um, quite um, profound because what do you mean you can do nothing for me? The thing is that every child has that seed in them to grow and to flourish. All we need to do is create an environment uh, for, for them to take in all of that information and transform that. We can give something in the environment of the child from which he can choose and take. This method is too long to describe, but we, can, but we have before us the figure of a new master, the new teacher who's penetrated the secret of the child and remains humbly in admiration of the work. This new teacher will not disturb the child, but will serve every moment of his life, will serve like a follower of this person. So what Maria Montessori is saying, look at the nature of the child. And if we look at the nature of the child, then we can allow them to be creative. In um, Face to Face, Louis Sullivan talks about the, the, you know, what is education? And he says, the chief, Business is to now pave the way for the child that it may grow wholesome, proud and stalwart in its native powers. Thus the living idea of man, the free spirit, master of his powers shall find its form image in civilization, which shall set forth the highest craftsmanship, the artistry of living joyously in stable equilibrium. Thus widens the democratic vista. And he uh, talks about such dream is a vigorous daylight dream of a man's abounding power that he may establish in beauty, in joy on earth, a dwelling place devoid of fear. So how, how can education then be joyful? Uh, so Maria Montessori talks about a new education which is based on the child's development from uh, childhood to birth. Education must be reconstructed and based on the laws of nature and not preconceived notions of adultment. The basis of reform of education and society, which is necessity of our time, must be built on the scientific study of the man, the unknown. So what is this child like? Um, here, Louis Sullivan talks about uh, the child as a, all right, so, he says, the child by this time is passing out of its reveries. Life is glowing, very real, very tangible. This is a young child. So shall its awakening powers be trained in the glowing real, the tangible, the three hours made glowing and real to it as a part of its world. Real life experiences are important at this age. Now, arise, now arrives the stage of pre-adolescence. Unromantic urge of his hastening vegetative growth, the power of the literal, the bovine, disturbed at times by prophetic revere. This is the time for literal instruction. So the rules of grammar, the, uh, you know, I, I say that these are the years when they need to get their spelling rules, grammar rules, math facts, everything down pat. So these are the years between the ages of seven and 12 where once they understand the rules, they can then make the leap into abstract uh, world. Then comes the stage of adolescence, when the whole being tends to delinquent, deliquesce into instability, vague idealism, emotions hitherto unknown to, to, or despised, bashfulness, false pride, false courage, introspection, impulsiveness, inhibitions, awkward consciousness of self, yet with an eye clairvo clairvoyant to the beauty which it seeks, a stirring in the soul of glory, of adventure, of romance. 
the plastic age of impressionability of enthusiasms, also the danger age, the age of extreme susceptibility under the cover of indifference in self-protection, the age when thoughts and musings are most secret, the age that makes or breaks. And here we saw earlier that when Louis Sullivan was of this age, his grandfather was very uh, influential. And he says to Louis Sullivan, either you're going to be great or you're going to go down a path that would destroy you. And so, you know, it is uh, most educators or parents feel that by, you know, the age of seven to 15, the child has got all the knowledge that they need and is able to read and write. And so they can make the moral um, decisions on how they can perform. And so a lot of decision-making is given uh, to the children at that time. But really the children's brains are not developed fully by that time. And they're, they're still, their character, their personality is still developing. So to give that responsibility to a young teenager is, is um, uh, quite a big folly uh, actually on the adult's part, uh, but to lead them through that impressionable age with giving big work uh, that uh, Louis Sullivan and Maria Montessori talk about is great. So he says, uh, the first main objective is, fixing, is, is in fixing sound character, the power to feel straight, to think straight, to act straight, to encourage pride in well-doing, to make so clear the moral nature of choice that the individual may visualize the responsibilities involved in the consequence of choice. This is the time to put on the heavy work, to direct his power into worthwhile channels, to prepare adolescents to be worthwhile adults, free in spirit, clean in pride, with footing on solid earth, with social vision and truth. So, uh, then we say, okay, so what should school look like? And here is a picture from the 1800s um, or early 1900s. And in many schools, even now, this is pretty much the same picture that the teacher is the, at the lead and the children's job is to passively take in the information. Um, many students, I mean, if you look at many of these buildings, the buildings themselves are uninspiring. They look like prisons and um, huge uh, walled prisons. Uh, so why would children feel inspired in there? Why would children want to go to school? They're not even, uh, you know, they're, they're just going from one lesson to another to another without really being able to create anything of their value or interest. So is there an alternative? And we see that uh, if we follow the child, like Maria Montessori and um, Louis Sullivan are saying, there is an alternative. There is a way where we can build a school where children will have choice, where it's more like their home environment, where they are free to move. The freedom is the first part. When, they are, when children learn how to be responsible and uh, have the freedom to move and to, to think, they can then make choices. Thus it shall teach the nature of choice at the beginning. It shall allow the child to dream, to give vent to its wondrous imagination, its deep creative instinct, its romance. It shall recognize that every child is the seat of genius, for genius is the highest form of play with life's forces. It shall allow the precious being to grow in its wholesome atmosphere of activities, giving only that cultivation which a careful gardener gives. The children shall be the garden. So in a Montessori classroom, you know, often uh, you'll notice that the classroom is uh, prepared very, very carefully with only the things that are meaningful to the child and to developing their imagination to developing their um, their skill sets and anything extra anything extraneous is taken out of the environment so that the child can then just focus on the highest possible things and whether it's literature music art physical education or reading writing math history geography you present the highest possible 
that humans have achieved so that they can, uh, they can emulate those. It shall utilize the fact that the child mind in its own way can grasp an understanding of things and, and ideas. Suppose now in our pride of feudal thought to be beyond its reach and to, you know, going back to what Maria Montessori said, that is it the adult's job to tell them what to think or is it our job to teach them how to think? The child can certainly process all the information and just because it's a child does not mean that they cannot think. It shall recognize that a child undisturbed feels its own way, the sense of power within it and about it that by intuition, the child is mystic, close to nature's heart, close to the strength of the earth. Thus, the child will be warded, will be a wholesome, happy child. It will forecast a pathway to maturity. So an outcome of this education system is to develop individuals who are able to think for themselves, who can create, th create their own um, environment. So, um, there is one part that um, Rob read, and I uh, want to read that section again because it's really dear to me. That's the part on which our school is based. So I run a Montessori school um, in Massachusetts, and our school is called Think, Explore, Create. The idea is that every human being can think for themselves and they can explore ideas, materials, tools, anything that's available to them and create their own environment. So this portion where in as much as man has been affirmed herein as sound and kindly, let us examine him. To begin, he is a worker and a wanderer with his bodily powers, the power to change situations and to make new situations. With his 10 fingers, he can do wonderful things Thus he manipulates, he further changes situations. One sees here an adventurer, a craftsman, the doer, ever growing power. Now comes into view the power we call curiosity and coupled with it, the power to inquire. The result of inquiry we call knowledge, the objective we call science. The more, the objective of science is more knowledge, more power, more inquiry, more power. And then, goes on to talk about the ability to think. He, he reverses the dictum, I think, therefore I am. It becomes in him, I am, therefore I inquire and do. This affirmative I am is man's reality. And then it goes on to talk about developing a moral sense. So, um, Without the moral sense, so we can have the intellectual, the academic part, but without having a moral character, uh, Louis Sullivan says that you cannot have a democratic vista because every individual in the society has to follow a code of conduct that is going to help it. If we recognize these powers in every individual, then they can. So can a school have a moral conduct, can we teach that? Now, in the past, this job was the job of religion or uh, the community and culture was taught through that. Part of it is what Louis Sullivan calls feudal, that it was based on fear. And how can humans develop their own values? Um, this is not easy and uh, not easy to do, but by teaching children values at an early age by inculcating in them habits. So what happens is what religion and uh, culture traditions do is that they train the mind to think in a certain way. For example, I'm a vegetarian. I was taught from my childhood that eating meat is not right. And so when I make food choices, my instinct is not to eat meat. Now that has nothing to do with um, whether it's right or wrong for me to eat meat. It's just something that has been, you know, my first reaction is that. I will say that whenever I've accidentally eaten meat, I've enjoyed it. So, <laughs> um, but the thing is that if we teach children to think rationally, if we teach children to reason, if we teach um, children uh, that, 
they can think for themselves and can create they can problem solve, they can create their own environment, then that becomes their mode of operation. So what happens when you're caught in a situation, our reflex, our first thing is flight or you know uh, fear. And so if we are going to flight or fight, so if you're going to say that, okay, in any situation, if I've trained the child to think for themselves, then that's the approach they're going to use. If we teach the child what everybody else is thinking about them or how you're fitting into the society correctly, then that's the approach they're going to take. So for education, it's important to teach children how to think and not what to think. Um, and that's the kind of society that Louis Sullivan is talking about. So I'm going to play a quick video here about how our school works. outcome of having an education system where children are free to choose, children can think for themselves, children can uh, work for themselves. And Louis Sullivan talks about that as, you know, here is a society where then we can have um, a civilization based on reason, on sanity. Maria Montessori says, this is the hope, a new, a hope in new humanity a hope in a new humanity that will come from this new education, an education that is collaboration of man and the universe, that is a help for evolution. As the child be begins perhaps to push humanity to this next higher plane in which many or all of our unsolvable problems can be solved. So, she talks about, you know, how adults are limited. She says, perhaps, we, all the grown up people thinking within the limitation and hardness of our narrow understanding have thought these problems unsolvable, but they are solvable by the child because he takes all not directly, but indirectly raising himself to a higher level. For the child is growing and is growing onto the next plane. There is all, there is, this is the way also for the solution of other problems. And, um, Louis Sullivan says that, you know, our, our dream shall be a civilization founded upon the ideas thrillingly seen, a civilization, a social fabric squarely resting on man's quality of virtue as a being, created by man, the real in the image of his fruitful power of beneficence, created in the likeness of his aspirant emotions. Such dream is the vigorous daylight dream of man's abounding power that he may establish in beauty and joy on the earth a dwelling place devoid of fear. So right here, we can create this civilization for ourselves. And he wrote this book uh, over a hundred years ago and we are still only scratching the surface. There is much work to be done and um, it begins with the education of our children. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Rupali, that was wonderful. Excellent, uh, so folks, now it's your chance to comment on anything. Uh, go ahead. Uh, we have a note. Okay, wait a minute. Uh, Robin Sherry. Yes. Um, we wanted to mention something. Uh, Rupala, you read this line about um, children shall be the garden. 
and um, we have. Do you, you want to oh, pull that I, out? I'll pull it up. We were we were um, digging to find Froebel's. Um, immediately, the German came into mind. Kindergarten. Kindergarten. My children. Child, child garden. garden. And the origin of that, I knew it was German. But I found it's from Friedrich Froebel, who you have his dates there. Yeah, Froebel's dates are 1782 to 1852. Remember, we talked about um, Frank Lloyd Wright's um, influence on that. He felt that the Froebel gifts, the Froebel blocks were an influence. Um, he kind of misremembers that year. He says they were <laughs> in his kindergarten, but uh, he didn't get them till he was at least age nine. So it's not quite the same thing, but Froebel here, um, do you want to read it? It's, it's a, uh, I found a website that has a description. Froebel was an educator who believed in self-activity and hands-on learning for children. He also had a love for nature, science, and mathematics. He felt children need to be nurtured and carefully tended like plants, tended to like plants in a garden. Hence, he founded an early education program for young children, which he called kindergarten. It was a place where children could develop and flourish freely through self-directed play under the guidance, not direction, of the teacher. So, I mean, I don't know if uh, Rupali has more to say on that, but it sounds like Froebel, I mean, was very much a precursor of the Montessori approach. Yes, I, I agree. And she has written about him, uh, about mm -hmm. Froebel and the influences of Froebel and Piaget both on her system. Mm -hmm. But what I love is that um, it's, it's essentially in the air, this idea um, of children being the garden and Sullivan is picking that up um, he, when he's talking about the importance of education in children so um yeah. i love I was, that yeah i was thinking about the same thing because when you read maria montessori and louis sullivan you see the free spirit the creative mm -hmm. spirit uh the garden the children's garden children's house all of these have like a common theme going mm -hmm. around and i was also wondering if it was something that everybody was talking about at that time it's also interesting that he calls his book Kindergarten Chats because it is yes. kindergarten for adults. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the yeah. same same kind of thought. Um, wonderful. So folks, uh, anybody else? Uh, now this I'm just throwing it open to anybody. Uh, if you have any comments, any thoughts about what was said, um, what you got from the meetup, this is the time to do that. Uh, we're going to start uh, with Joe followed by Evanique. Joe. Yeah, I mean, it was fantastic presentations everyone because i mean as i've kind of gone through this now i'm starting to see the depth of louis sullivan and you kind of kind of you can relate it to other things like we're covering something with the design way i can see that louis sullivan is actually one level higher than that like or however you want to put it it's it's there's a depth there that um doesn't isn't readily apparent uh without everybody coming here and having the discussions that we've been having um you know the idea of uh, just really quickly about the imagination and self uh that is critical because of the understanding of your imagination is essentially you're talking about consciousness you can decide what's going to happen in the future so i'm going to sacrifice what i'm going to do today and that's fundamental to your will because you, you wouldn't otherwise have it so that's something that, you know, that we've talked about here in, in other uh, discussions as well. But the interesting part was the inverted self, I think. The inverted self, I if, you know, if I'm correct, correct me if I'm approaching this incorrectly, but that an inverted self looks at forms first. Yes. And then functions second. And that's, that's, the, that's the problem. I think that's in many ways, I think that's the way we actually teach in school. <clears throat> this is what we actually, we teach people to solve the problems, but hold on to the form that is existing as opposed to looking at the function itself. And that is the inverted self. And when you're looking at life like that, that is, it, it's, it's in, it becomes paralyzing and that's design. When you start to be able to see this, what you're starting to see is the whole. 
And that's where you can talk about the individual and the community. You can even break it down to right brain, left brain, and how Louis Sullivan, even in the previous chapter, Merit talks about mathematics as an art. You can kind of, it's the idea that if you apply this, this uh, approach of understanding the function first, then you can start to really understand how to solve problems at their core as opposed to, and I, and, and I, and again, I think this is something that um, is, uh, uh, you know, again, at the heart of our educational system is our educational system teaches us to look at the forms, solve them very quickly. And we talked about this a little bit in a way uh, when we were talking about problem solving during the design way. Uh, we talked about the distinction between tame problems and wicked problems and how, you know, sometimes you may solve a tame problem just like that, and it's algorithmic, it's very, but you're not necessarily thinking about the function of the form itself and how that would actually correct something. And then you can actually see how the individual fits into a community or the community also feeds the individual. So this has actually been an incredibly lightning, enlightening experience. And uh, so I wanna thank everyone that's presented because as we've gone through this, you can start to see how this fits into everything that we've talked about, you know, yin, yang, whatever, however you wanna say, it, uh, you know, right brain, left brain. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of other things that I have as far as notes, but I think that inverted itself is a really important point. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. I uh, just want to remind you that when Ruth Bernstein was here and he was complaining about science education, he says he has had tremendous difficulty with science educators because they are just looking at the products of science. And in trying to transmit the products of science, they are destroying people's ability to actually think about science and to do science. It's the same, same point. Wonderful. Uh, next up is Evanique. Yeah, I would think, again, thank you everyone who presented today. It was really enlightening. Um, so the thing I really got was like, ego is not being a bad thing. Like, I think we are really taught in society that ego is bad. And uh, even like religious, you know, uh, philosophical, we're looked at the ego as, as a hindrance. And I think today... Um, when it says, uh, I, without ego, man vanishes. I thought about that and I was like, wow, there is value to having your own individual thoughts and your own individual ideas and being creative. And the individual is absolutely important. And yes, the community is important too. But like Maritza used the example in the forest, um, you know, Yes, the community can help you grow and empower you. I'm paraphrasing Marissa, by the way. Um, but you, if you don't, you got to reach for the sun. You got to go for your own goals or you're going to die. And so I, I love, I love that. And I think with the, um, let me just go to my notes. I think when it says uh, government slash, I wrote, uh, when he talked about feudalism, he said, uh, we trade safety for a master and servant psychologically. And I wrote government and society somehow has taken away from the individual. And Sheree Kant mentioned the Declaration of Independence and Independence Hall. It's not the way the government was designed. The government was not designed to do that. The government was designed to really protect the individual and to keep individual freedoms and to keep that individuality. And somehow we have voluntarily given that power to the government, our individual freedoms. And, you know, not to sound like a particular party, uh, but I think in a lot of ways we have given up. And it's just for comfort, I think. I think it really is just for comfort. Like, We've given up the way we educate our kids and to let them individually shine. It's easier, it's easier in a sense to just go with the flow and follow what the government says to do. Like everybody knows that the education system is not working for everybody and it's not working for most people, but we keep to it because it's just the easiest thing to do. And we as individuals in our country have given that up. So 
I just thought this was really interesting. And I just have um, one thing that Maritza was talking about when she said the questions and one of the questions from the book is, is genius rare? I never thought about that because we were always taught gen genius is rare. That is a special kind of intelligence. But I'm like, if you think about it, everybody is has a, a thing that they're really good at. And in a sense, they're a genius at. So I just thought that was uh, riveting. And uh, finally, when we said, um, oh, when Joya was talking about works and deeds reveal a choice um, and that the choice reveals who we are. And I was thinking that like how we choose things also reveals us to ourselves. Like, you know, people are always looking for who they are, or looking for introspection. Look at the choices you make, according to Sullivan, because that is who you are. The choices that you make of free will is who you are. So that's something to take away from myself as an individual to really look at and go deeper with. It's like, okay, these choices I make, why do I make them? Especially you know, sometimes we make choices that we know don't work, but we just do it just because it's convenient. And it, it's just that. So I really took away a lot for myself and studying individualism and looking how individual is definitely a positive thing. And it's a critical thing to function in society because if we stop focusing on you know, what everybody else is doing, and you know, stop trying to suppress individualism and, you know, stop trying to make people conform and just appreciate everybody's beauty for what it is. And like, together we can make it better. So it's like individual and community. And uh, yeah, I love that inverted human analogy because I, I think it is a uh, function following form instead of form following function. It's the perfect description of it. So I, I thought about that. So it's just a lot of things to think about and a lot of things to go back and reread the chapter about. So thank you, everybody. You guys did an amazing job and it was wonderful. Thank you, Evanique. That was just amazing, amazing comments. Uh, Robin Sherry. Thank you. So I, I was struck by the- What the, Evanique just said about- About genius being rare. And I think people, you know, we use genius now to mean, oh, somebody who's super intelligent has very high IQ. Um, orig the original root of genius is from the same as the root word for genesis, you know, the, the beginning of something. And genius means more than just intelligence. It also means the power to originate. And I think that's what Sullivan's really saying is, he says, is, sort of asked rhetorically, is genius rare? He means that everyone has the power to originate something. To create. Yeah, yep. to create. And uh, specifically to originate something that has not been necessarily been done before. So I think that's the, the sense in which he means that is, you know, that there are differences in ability, but everybody has the ability to originate. Yeah, I, I want to comment something. And then uh, Rupali has something. Uh, Evany, great, great comments. Um, I mean, it's all of those things are related. You're talking about, you know, people want to be comfortable. They don't want to rock the boat. They want to go with something safe. All of that is saying that I'm going to just go with the forms that are there. And the moment you do that, you are undercutting all individuals. You're just, you know, uh, you know, getting rid of the individuals. Another way of looking at it is the way um, Jacob Bronowski looks at it. He's saying that in traditional cultures, the child is shown the image of the adult, like the, you know, the Easter Island faces. That is the ceiling. That's where you need to go and stop. That is destroying the meaning of a child, meaning of even primates, let alone human beings. And that's what we do because that's form. You're saying this form has been achieved. That is the ceiling. That's where you, you should go to and you should aspire to and you stop there. Anything else is not right. That's, so it's, it kind of inverts uh, that. So I, th I think that in, inversion concept is, is very, very deep. And thank, thank you for all the comments. Great, great comments. Uh, next up is Rupali. So Evanik, I just wanted to uh, share a little story about, you know, we, you talked about uniqueness and is genius rare. So um, if we look in education that, you know, every child is unique 
and you really look at what makes each child pick, then you can really find something in every child that they can shine in. And what happens in our traditional systems, we only value certain uh, parts of education that are unique. So we have a, we have a student, she absolutely um, fear, was very fearful of math and she avoided mathematics. And um, when it came to our technology class, she said, well, uh, as she was studying ultrasonic, um, she was studying sound waves and uh, how bats and owls, uh, I mean, bats, yeah, uh, and dolphins um, hear sound. And she said, okay, I'm, during technology class, she said, I'm going to actually build a bat or a uh, and a dolphin. And uh, the teacher said, well, you have to know your math facts so that you can program it. She first built the whole thing and then she couldn't make it move. And so the teacher uh, asked her to work at it and she did because she had something real to work on and made progress on that. Very quickly, she was able to program it, but you know, she came with this artistic background. She loves art, that's who she is. She couldn't bear to see just the wires and the pieces of the robot that acted like an owl, uh, a bat or acted like a dolphin. So she created this beautiful costume for it, sewed it, made it. And then it was probably the best robot we had, you know, a beautiful robot of a bat and a beautiful dolphin robot that worked well. So each child can shine in their own ways. Each human can shine in their own ways. And we had another student, I've talked about him. He's actually come to talk uh, on 52 Living Ideas about poetry and um, every child also has their own struggles. And so um, for him to work in a traditional classroom is challenging with all of the management of time and organization, but he absolutely uh, took to poetry and uh, developed poetry. And so when he went to a traditional school uh, for middle school, he kind of was just trying fitting in there, but not being himself. And then the teacher said, okay, we're going to study poetry for the next week, uh, whole month. And every night I want all of you to write a poem and read it aloud in class next day. And he, every morning the teacher would say, who has a poem to read? And he was the only one who would raise his hand. Um, and every day he started reading poems aloud, so much so that uh, the high school students started to come to listen to his poems every morning in the middle school class. And soon he became known as the poet laureate of the school. And suddenly he found his place in that society, you know, where he was struggling to fit in. So yes, every person has a gift. It's up to us to see. And actually I think of them like diamonds you know we have to polish them we have to take away the rough edges and um, and see how they shine and where they shine and everyone shines in their own unique way Nicole, i just wanted to share something with you um i was telling some of my friends about this meetup this particular one and one of my friends gail her granddaughter has she's on the lower scale of autism and you know and the Philadelphia schools and Yating in the Think Delaware County School District, they wanted to put her in a special class. And her grandmother kept fighting, like, no, like, this is not going to help her. You know, she's just learns differently. And so she didn't, so they finally put her in another school district. But she said this, like, she just thought, like, what I was learning about Louis Sullivan and education, and I told her about you. And she just thinks it's amazing. And she's like, it just confirms her decision to fight for her granddaughter. And she just like, she was like, finally, there's people out there that get that her daughter is just her own unique person, not even different in a bad way. It's just like, she just learns the way she learns. And, and the girl is a brilliant young lady. She's like 11 or 12. She's about to go in her preteens and she's brilliant, but they, you know, they weren't going to see that in Philadelphia. They weren't going to see that in Delaware County. So her daughter moved out to Montgomery County in um, Wayne, PA. So that means she's in the Ratner School District, which is one of the best in Pennsylvania. And they are really helping her along. And she's just a beautiful young woman. But, you know, 
so she was just so encouraged about what you were doing. So this does make a difference outside of 52 Living Ideas or people who even come. So thank you. That is so true. Thank you for sharing that story. Uh, you know, one thing I say to parents, please do not relegate your, uh, you know, education of your children to educators. You have to be involved all of the time. Just because children go to school does not mean that your job uh, as a parent is done. Uh, you have to be really watchful and careful about what's been taught and how it has been taught and how your child is being made to think. So um, good for your friend, uh, you know, who took charge of a granddaughter's education and found the right place for her. Wonderful. Thank you. Next up is Jyoti. Hi, I have been putting my ideas on the chat all along. <laughs> I uh, enjoyed what, how Rob started his presentation because he really you know, put everybody on, uh, he aligned everybody <laughs> because he captured all the ideas about Sullivan's concept of man. And I would suggest that our, we, are, we have a group now, we are, we are starting Designing Way. They should all read this, at least this particular chapter because it explains everything about how a man can design. Everything is, a, he's a wanderer, he is a creator, he can uh, move uh, from one place to another, he can get around, he can use his 10 fingers to build, to create, and what have you. So, and uh, so that I would suggest um, Srikant, that maybe you can <laughs> suggest to the group to read this particular chapter. If they can't read the whole uh, book, which is a little bit difficult to read at this stage before the designing way, but they should read this. They will get uh, um, profound ideas. So uh, just I just want to respond to that. So I'm going to do two things. One is that I'm going to put this video in the playlist for not only Louis Sullivan, but the other design way. And I'll put some comments there to connect both of those. So some people will end up watching this video. Second thing what will happen is that once I want to understand that book on its own terms a little bit, and then I will start integrating Louis Sullivan's ideas into it because both of them are actually trying to do the same thing. Louis Sullivan yes. is doing it in a more poetic way and far more profound level at a far more profound level. The integration that he's doing far more profound, but Harold Nelson is capturing those things far more precisely, explicitly, and systematically, which is of value too. So it is, it is a great way of connecting up. So I want to get that started first. I want people to understand it in its, in its own term. Somewhere in the middle, I will start introducing the connections between that. But great, to definitely plan to do that. Go ahead, Jyoti. Okay, the other thing I was going to... Um... Um, talk about if, uh, Evanix, your presentation, you know, your narrative that you just said uh, was exactly what I was thinking mm -hmm. about. Because I also thought, even as a psychologist, I thought ego was a negative aspect of our personality. And after reading this, I said, yeah, it makes sense. What are we without our ego? You know, we are lost. We are, you know, we are not individualistics. We cannot produce, we cannot come up with unique ideas. And that's how we make the, the how that's how the society is formed. Like Rob said, our egos that is action, and that's how we make our society. So that you well said, it was very well said. And I think the third point that I said was, was going to make was, and I, I marked it here, um, the container of self powers. This is very important. That also Rob started saying that a moving center of radiant energy, awaiting his time to create a new in his proper image. Are then the multitudes in for time? Is genius rare? And I think Evanik, uh, I mean, uh, Evanik also, you also covered that. That, you know, you would think the genius are you know, rare, but it's not that. They are not rare. They, we all have in us a genius, but we don't recognize that. We don't look at us ourselves like that. So it's the man. Uh, we have to understand what is man all about. And once we understand what the man is all about, then we have more respect 
and we can expect more from a man. Here they are sitting in a beautiful room on the fifth floor or the 10th floor. And we are not talking about the man who's sitting there. We're talking about the architecture. We are not, we are so far away from the, uh, you know, what he calls it, um, ego at the elbow. So these are the points that I'm, you know, wanted to, but um, she did a very good job, Evanik, very good. <laughs> you, you put it all together. But I was putting them in the chat because I knew I was going to pick them up and then make something out of it. I have to say this, and I have said that in the beginning. This is my favorite truth. I come here, this is like going to uh, the temple or Gurdwara or whatever you want to say to whatever religion, religious groups I come from. And I hear everything so intently. And I'm in now uh, what Joy I would call and Marisa would call and a complete flow. Everything that you guys say, it's so soaking in. And I think about it. I read about it and I think about it. And I said, you know what? That I'm really very fortunate to have this group here uh, who explain things the way they should be explained. There's no hanky-panky here. There is down-to-earth explanation. Thank you so very much. And thank you, Srikant, again. Thank you. Thank you, Jyoti. And I also want to thank all the panelists here because I've always wanted to talk about Louis Sullivan and make his ideas accessible to people. But with this amount of firepower coming at the problem from so many different angles, plus all the comments of everybody, I think I think it's just just it's just magnificent. Uh, Rupali. So uh, Jyoti mentioned reading this chapter with the group in Design Way. Actually, I had marked this for our teacher professional day uh, for our teachers to read this chapter. We, you know, the whole school, parents and teachers, we recently read The Formation of Man by Maria Montessori. And this chapter just flows so well in conjunction with that book. Uh, and that's what education should be for everyone. And uh, I, I think that Jyoti, you made a good point. Everybody should read this chapter. Wonderful. Um, anybody else, any comments? All right, wonderful. Uh, Jeff, go ahead. Well, first of all, I, I, I wanna really um, appreciate the work and the perspectives um, that all of you brought to this as well, that you, each of you in, in your own way, coming from your own vantage point, you, you are quite brilliant in your own way. And, um, and I just wanna thank you for the, for the work that you put into this and the thoughtfulness. Um, I am, I am going to uh, um, courteously disagree with, um, with maybe one thing. And, and, and I think as, I, as I've listened to you all today and, and, and appreciated deeply um, what the, the, the point that I think you've been trying to make, um, I, I think that I completely agree with the point. I just think it's not the only relevant point. And, um, and so I, I, I looked up, I looked up that, you know, this, this quote that's attributed to Einstein and, and saw the quote that that's actually, that, that he probably actually did say. He said, it can scarcely be denied that the supreme goal of all theory is to make irreducible basic elements as simple and as few as possible without having to surrender the adequate representation of a single datum of experience. And the, what he's you know, alleged to have said, but they can find no place that he actually said it was, which was that everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. And um, I, I completely agree that um, in theory, the potential of the individual person, the authentic, genius potential, as well as, um, you know, potential to be compassionate and um, reach and, and contribute to one's own life and to others is, you know, virtually um, uh, greater than we could ever imagine. 
Um, and so I, I completely agree with that. Um, and, um, and I also think that, uh, and, and, and I'll, I'll give you a, new, a, a mathematical representation, a very simple mathematical representation of it in a moment, and then I'll stop. Um, I, I also think that the capacity, if, you, if history has taught us anything, it's taught us that human beings also have a capacity for evil. And so I don't find myself being able to give up that side of the equation so quickly either, because it's so significant, I believe in history and in our current times. And I don't see us evolving out of it quickly in the foreseeable future. So, so what I come to here is, what question are we trying to answer? What are the questions to which these things are the answer? So if the question is, does, does, does a human being as an individual have unlimited potential? Okay, well, that's one question. Um, how can humanity continue to move forward in a way where we survive and thrive? Maybe is another question. And, and the, the math of this that I found compelling is simply this, that the, the number of relationships between two people, if you just think of something as one or the other, is two. The number of relationships between three entities is six. And six is more complicated than two. And so I think that our idea that things are both and in combination with each other and not so much either or is a very, very powerful conceptual foundation. And it, it makes things more complicated, but I think it's more real. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, let's see, um, I mean, firstly, I think that Louis Sullivan very much talks about the evil. The entire concept of the inverted self is exactly that. And he's saying that most of the culture, most of the times is dominated by these uh, inverted people. And that's what evil is. So he has a full, I mean, he's saying that relatively sane people are fewer and, but at the same time, the, the, the power. So absolutely he, he deals, deals with that one. Uh, next up is Jyoti followed by Joe. Yeah, I just wanted to humor you guys. I went to my orthopedic doctor and he explaining to me form follows function in <laughs> my theatrica. And, and I just sat there, <laughs> deadpan expression, like I didn't know what he was talking about. <laughs> so I said, yes, thank you. I understand. <laughs> That's thank, <all>. you. <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I, one thing I would add uh, for, for Jeff is that he's very much aware of the network effects of things. There are ways of kind of calculating network effects in terms of what kind of effect, is it positive or negative? And the extent to which it affects different networks will vary, but whether it is positive or net negative has, you know, remains the same. You may not be able to calculate exactly. For example, if you're doing something good, what is the impact on other people? It's very difficult to calculate that, but whether it is positive or negative on what kind of people, you can just see the general direction. So you kind of have to, operate at a level which is uh, which which is of that kind. Uh, next up is Joe. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there is a balance between this individual and community and community and individual, however you want to shape it. But I think a very important point, it, it is a both end. I, but I think I look at this as almost like order and chaos. Yep. And, and essentially, how are you bringing order into the world? And you're doing that through your innovation, your creativity, your individual. But you don't, uh, what was the uh, uh, first rule of Jordan Peterson there that, that during uh, Beyond Order was don't carelessly denigrate social institutions or creative achievement. And I, I think that that's an important thing to realize is that you have, you're expressing your individuality and you are bringing something new and creative to the environment but you're respecting the institutions that exist and the understanding why they exist in the first place. And that's what happens when we're, we're I think that we, we are, I agree with Jeff, that we are maybe looking at this as 
um, if, if you look at it as the inverted self where the forms, uh, you know, or where you're addressing the forms and not the functions, I think the, the problem is, is that we don't even necessarily consider the functions sometimes. And I think that's what kind of Lewis Sullivan's really talking to us about is to consider the function and then understand if the form that you're actually replacing it with is something that is really truly creative that serves the greater good. And that's where the individual and the, and the community come in and it works kind of in unison with one another. But I, but I agree it's a both and. But it, it, again, I think there's an appreciation. And the thing that I have actually said in, in passing to Sri Khan is the thing that I, I find to be most um, uh, you know, unique about uh, Sullivan is, or beautiful actually, is a sense of, in the beginning of the book is how he appreciates what everybody does, what the workers do, you know, what each individual does. That appreciation is really important for a number of reasons, because you start to understand why they're doing it. And you start to understand the functions around that. And that once you have that knowledge, then you can be creative and that and that's where the outside is breaking in and that's that's where the that comes in so i i don't think it's a, it's a something where uh i i think he's calling to attention and in a way if he talks about and he talks about the moral aspect of it there's the moral aspect of it as well where you have to create you have to uh consider what the forms that you're creating and how they serve the whole and I think that that's the most important. So it isn't either or, it's both and, as Jeff said. But I think Sullivan really is capturing, I think he's, he's saying that our individuality is being lost in these systems, especially when we don't question them properly. So um, that's, uh, that's uh, all I have to add to that. Yeah, no, ab uh, absolutely. I think he's, uh, Sullivan is very big. On my, I don't have the quote. I don't know if anybody else has the quote, but he's talking about how if you really understand the individual and respect the individual, you will have a way of approaching where you're saying all other individuals are like that. And then there is an and of that, that he's very, very explicit about that. And that is the, the root of his optimism of what he calls a democratic vista, that if you identify that this is what the functions are and you respect those functions in everybody else, what you're going to create is going to be the end. Um, go ahead. Really quickly, yeah, that's that's the key right there, is you don't disrespect the functions just because. You, that's why you don't denigrate and tear down something and just think you have to start from a new without considering what is right but that's what that's the heart of you know heart of louis sullivan's approach you exactly know, yeah no that, that's that, what I, that this is there for every individual there for every individual um rupali you wanted to uh say something yeah i just want to uh, read a couple of um, sentences from the chapter to address jeff's uh, point so he talks about uh, the power of imagination and and why people haven't really understood what a man is. He says, um, the preoccupation of the, with the inverted self makes it clear why man has turned his back on man, why man is still unknown to himself and unsuspected. So long as imagination slight, slightly tricked him into self-deprecation, he could not know himself and the neighbor must remain a stranger to be feared, despised uh, or placated. And then he goes on to say towards the end of the chapter, that if we do actually recognize the uh, powers of man in every human being, if we, and, and he starts the chapter with this, if with open mind one reads and observes industriously and long, if in so doing one covers a wide field and so covering reflects in terms of realism, he is likely sooner or late, late to be brought to a sudden consciousness that man is an unknown quantity and his existence unsuspected. But then he ends with the chapter that we've discovered this human potential, we've discovered the powers in every individual. And if we build a civilization on that basis, on that foundation, uh, such civilization shall endure and even grow in culture, for it shall have a valid moral foundation, understandable to all. It will possess a vigor hitherto undreamed of, 
a versatility, a virtuosity, a plasticity yet unknown for all work for all work will be done with a living purpose and the powers of mankind shall be utilized to the full. Hence, there shall be no, no waste. Um, no dream, no aspiration, no prophets, prophecy can be seen. Now. Man shall find his anchorage in self-recognition. So he, uh, you know, he's not unaware of the evils of our own mind, but he, as Srikant mentioned, is very optimistic of what humans can do if we recognize um, you know, our own potential and nurture that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rupali. So I, I'll read out the passage that uh, Maritza pointed out. Um, Thus, each one is the only one. If we have mused long upon the immense fecundity and industry of life, the paradox vanishes. The only one and the all coalesce. The individual and the mass become one in a new phase of power whose stupendous potency of creative art in civilization stuns the sense of possibility. Now opens to our view the democratic vista. Next up is, um, is Joya followed by Evanique. Joya. No, I was just going to read. I had found that, that quote, so I was going to ah, read it for okay. me, but you found Thank it you. before me. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks to Marisa. Uh, next up is Evanique. Yeah, I just, um, when Joe was talking about uh, Louis Sullivan and, and the workers, I also thought of when he was young, when he was just a boy, he was, he focused on the beauty of work. And I think uh, other people have covered about how it contributes to the society. I think it was the sweet, this, oh gosh, I'm going to get tongue tied. The street sweepers. Um, and, the, the, and you know how they would just move the snow and everything every day and how they would just clear the path and how he just thought that was fascinating and beautiful. But I also wanted to talk to Jeff's point um, and that I forget where I read it, but they were talking about the way cathedrals were built and could, cathedrals took three, like upwards of 300 years before modern technology to build. So there, it wasn't done in a lifetime, obviously. It was done in several lifetimes, but there was a higher goal. And in their mind, it was the higher goal of God. But I think what Louis Sullivan is pointing to is that, yes, this is hard. And yeah, we're going to have to overcome. And yes, we're going to, like, how does society move forward? I think it's groups like this. I think it's, you know, people realizing their potential as individuals and seeing how that makes a contribution to society. And over time, as we can see throughout history that yes, there was evil that existed, but that the human nature did overcome those evils. And yes, there will always be some there because there will always be inverted individuals. But if we're willing to just add to positivity to the society and add our gifts, or add our, our own genius to society, it moves society forward. Maybe it's not as fast as we would like it to be, but it does. And you can, if you look throughout history, you can see how things moved forward and how far we are today. So I think, I think that's it too. I think you just have to, you know, have to look at, you know, making a contribution and being your own individual self. So I think that's where Louis Sullivan was going with it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Let's go to uh, Maritza and then let's close up. We're running a little bit uh, late. Maritza. Sorry, guys, just really quickly. Um, so I, I believe with just about every fiber of my being that it's, it's not an option. We cannot some days pick either or and some days pick yes and. What I'm seeing here is a confirmation of something I've held near and dear that we have to view things as yes and. We have to view it as a more inclusive because that's the way we're gonna find that forward path. Um, and Sullivan calls it, uh, he actually says, it's the richness of the soul life of the multitudes that inspires. And that's amazing to me, soul life of the multitudes. So in other words, 
we have to find our way from being strong individuals to being these multitudes which provide soul life for living. And I think that's beautiful. He does end the sentence by saying at, you know, and at times a pause the observer, but that's because change is hard. And that's because there are some truths that are very uncomfortable to look at face on. And, but I, I do believe that it's necessary and the reward will make it really worth it. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maritza. All right, uh, everybody, thank you. Thank you so much. It was just wonderful. And we're going to take the break, uh, take a break uh, for the next uh, weekend. We are not, uh, so we'll see, see you two weeks from today. Uh, I want to tell you that there is an amazing meetup tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern time. That's uh, Mark Stallman is going to be talking about the lost cause. It's going to be about Aristotle's four causes and how two of them were lost along the way and what to do about them. Uh, so see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.